Hi, I'm Dorothy Kaczynski. I'm the Vradenberg Director and CEO of the Phillips Collection, and I'm so glad that you've joined us for our conversation with artists. And today we're, we're Vesel Stratenovich, my colleague, my distinguished colleague, Vesel, will be in conversation with Nate Lewis. But I want to um, um, probe a little bit, a little retrospective glance. Um, I'm in the, hello, the wits. <laughs> I'm in a slightly retrospective mode as I look forward to the final days of my tenure, which concludes on December 31st. So I was thinking about our artists' conversations, which goes back to 2006. Oh, Susan, time flies. <laughs> which precedes me. I got here in 2008. So our Center for the Study of Modern Art, the the realization of a dream long held by the Phillips family, by Lachlan Phillips and Duncan before him, of course, um, to have a, an engine for thought and in, innovation and in, uh, instigation, maybe, and investigation was realized um, just as the Sant building was uh, accomplished and the carriage house was renovated. And normally, and I believe we'll go back to that, the carriage house was renovated as our um, black box, our innovative space, flexible. Um, I called it the tree house, um, where we um, had a lot of these programs unfold. But anyway, what's most interesting is, um, well, the concept also, I should say, was not just to have distinguished artists come and talk in a fairly intimate setting, but also that the artists would, I've suddenly gotten loud and it's not my fault, um, would spend time on the subsequent or preceding day with budding artists. Um, and we've had a series of different um, academic partnerships um, with um, University of Illinois, Champaign-Urbana, UVA, GW, UMD, a little bit with NYU. Um, and so that the, the the artist would spend time doing critiques in the artist's studio on the campus, which is such a precious gift, and I think was really one of the most precious parts of this entire initiative. But also exciting, the artists who we've had the privilege to host, and this is like no order, this was just me scribbling. Um, Juan Gechi Mutu, Amy Sherald, Leonardo Drew, <laughs> Katrin Sigurdar Totter, um, Dario Robletto, John Edwards, Kennedy Yanko, Renee Stout, Amy Cutler, Martha Wilson, Allison Schatz. I remember Vito Acconci, that was one of the first. And when we were walking with him to have a bite to eat afterwards, he said, why am I here at the Phillips Collection? Why, why is Vito Acconci talking at the Phillips Collection? And I said, we are forming a a vital conversation with the artists of our time, and I'm so glad you're here. But I remember that so vividly because I thought, oh, we're changing, invigorating, reclaiming the dialogue with the art of our time, which was so important to Duncan Phillips. And it goes on and on and on. Nikisha Durrett, Janine Antoni, Wolfgang Leib, Matthew Ritchie, Mark Dion, um, Jorge Pardo, Ilya and Emilia, Kabakov, Fred Wilson, Melchin. We've had an exciting um, roster of artists. Um, and I know that Vesela shares my excitement that we're talking to Nate Lewis today because we're both great admirers of his work. And I hope that, uh, and I, I rest assured that um, Vesela will tease out all of the wonderful complexity of Nate's background his medical uh, training, his artistic training, and how he accomplishes these incredibly, for me, balletic, sensitive, rhythmic interpretations of the human form and um, how all of that informs that. But anyway, thank you. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for this conversation. And I will very skillfully push the button to off. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, 
happy to see you all on this uh, afternoon. And thank you, Dorothy, for the introduction and supporting the program. Thank you, my colleague, Nehemiah Dixon, who is helping. Uh, and everybody else, Jeff, Brendan, and everybody, Catherine, Nalani, everybody who put effort, believe me, uh, to make this work and set up the chairs uh, so we can accommodate you. And thank you, Nate, for coming and joining us this afternoon. Um, just a little bit of bio, just very little, and then we're going to go straight into conversation. Really, the, the, the essence of the series, as Dorothy mentioned, is a conversation, not just a monologue, but trying to make it simple, trying to make it um, humane, trying to make it conversational. Um, and then we'll start with your slides, we'll just have a casual conversation, and then we'll open it up to you guys. Um, just, again, as I said, a little bit of a bio to give a context, but you can talk about more your coming out of nursing school, becoming artists. We are all dying to hear about that transition. But just to say that so many exhibitions came um, recently, specifically in New York. One, uh, we just have Ilya, um, who came from New York uh, with his son. Uh, the show was at Friedman Gallery, just closed down in October, I believe. That was the last presentation of your work. Mm -hmm. uh, but also, you showed here in Washington, D.C., before you left for New York. Um, at Morton Gallery, and I don't know if anybody is here to, to thank them. Mm -hmm. And I also want to thank somebody sitting in front of me, and that is our trustee, Susan Butler and Dixon Butler, who, I don't know, five, six years ago, sent an email to us, to Dorothy and myself, and our colleague, Klaus Sotman, saying, you've got to go and see the show. And uh, we failed. It was the real, this is the real thing. You've got to know this guy. So <laughs> it took you to go to New York, come back here, and um, sometimes that happens. So again, happy to have you here. But your work is in so many museums now, including the uh, Harlem uh, Museum, California, um, New York, here in Baltimore, uh, Sam, and that's really impressive. And so many residencies, including the Pioneer Residency, and mm -hmm. we'll talk about that, but you said it's very influential for your work. So with that said, I wanna read two things that really stuck in my mind reading about your work, and then we can start with, with the visual presentation. And that is, I'm gonna read it quickly. I'm interested in the unseen. My work is driven by empathy and the desire to understand nuanced point of view. My work is about political issues, yes, but more, it's about seeing, hearing, understanding with balance, nuance, and care. And I read this simply because I think it weaves through all your work. It resonates with every image I've seen. And I think as we're looking at the visuals and hear your story, uh, something to keep in mind and keep thinking about it as um, we have opportunity to ask more questions. So with that said, I turn it to you. OK. <clears throat> um, it means so much to be here. I'm not going to be able to put it all into words, but. I've never felt more comfortable, I think. Um, there's so many people in the room from so many different areas of my life. Um, my parents, my brother-in-law, my sister, my nephew, um, and then people from colleagues who I worked with in, in critical care for so many years that were uh, taught me so much, so much about caring for people, and so much about critical thinking, so much about teamwork. Um, so much about machines, about how the human body works, um, about finding balance, you know, within the human body and understanding how to care for families. Um, the list goes on with those people and then people from uh, my life just living in D.C., which is where I started creating art and, um, and started building community and I, I did an event when I lived here, and people supported it, and it was a beautiful thing. Um, people who I trained with, in particular martial arts, which is a huge part of my life. That was really my form of art, just athletics growing up, and it continues to be a continuous thread throughout my life, and it's something that all these different pillars of my life, it's what I you know, put into my work and the lens that I understand the world through. So I'm just, can't believe I'm here. I couldn't, 
have predicted any of this, but I'm just so grateful for all the support for everybody that came here. I'm like blown away, like my breath is taken away seeing everybody here, and I'm just honored to be here. <clears throat> so I guess, let me go to the first slide, and <clears throat> being that I'm a completely self-taught artist, um, the first time I ever drew my life was in 2010. So it's interesting, I've always been, I mean, in the past years, like recently, I've been, I mean, I guess uh, maybe the past few years, four or five years, like what, why you were interested, what you were interested in, and the visual language, you know, and that vocabulary, like why were you interested in it? And I feel like the first images that I actually paid attention to and where stakes were held um, and where history was held was in, in slides of like tissues, um, uh, human tissues, and I feel like this was probably in even grade school, really. Um, I definitely remember in like anatomy, uh, physiology, microbiology, like in college, but I don't remember too much imagery growing up, but this is something, it had a profound effect on me, seeing it. And I mean, there were just very slight differences in um, understanding what's the difference between cardiac tissue, between gastric tissue. And there's just very slight differences and I think imagery for me, early on, there was something where I was like, stakes are high with seeing it and understanding the very slight differences in, um, in what it means. And now in my work uh, and how I started working, it's, I worked in like this very cellular way and understanding these tiny little nuances um, between picking something one way um, between a mark, but the slightest change in that mark um, coming together with similar marks makes you know a whole and like a, a whole entire tissue or a tapestry. Can I ask a question yeah. for, for all of us? A little bit of again bio uh, information. How did you decide to go to VCU and study nursing? And tell us about really like practice of critical nursing. What, yeah. What? How did that, that experience inform your art? Yeah, so, I mean, I plan on going to nursing since I've been in sixth grade. Um, my father is a nurse anesthetist, still is a nurse anesthetist, and he's over here on the left with my mother. And um, So, yeah, from the time I was in fifth, fifth, sixth grade, I wanted to be a nurse anesthetist myself. Um, I was just interested in just biology and the human body, really. Um, and then, I um, yeah, I followed through. Um, I went to nursing school as soon as I uh, graduated um, high school, and I worked in intensive care. <clears throat> My plan was to work in intensive care and then go to anesthesia school, but I started making art. But um, intensive care was, um, it was, it was amazing. I mean, it was, it, it's so hard to, I learned so much from it. Um, I learned about systems. Um, in uh, the most complex way, I learned about you know this the, the ability of the human body to heal itself, um, the ability of uh, people to heal the human body, um, and just you know learned about the acuteness of life in such a traumatic way. Um, but yeah, I mean I learned a lot about about critical thinking and about problem solving, and I guess the interesting thing was that you know, working in, uh, you know, whatever, in the hospital taking care of people, you, you always had to figure it out. There was never like, a, oh, I, you can't not figure this out. It was always, you had to find the solution. But something I say that um, I think uh, what, that I translated from there to being an artist is, um, <clears throat> is assessment skills, really. Because, again, coming back to this idea of seeing, of hearing, of feeling physically, and then also just, just having like an intuition, it was like seeing and hearing, like stakes were high, again. Um, you, had to, you had to hear what was happening. You had to be able to decipher what was normal from what was not normal. Um, in terms of seeing, in terms of hearing, you had to be 
be able to listen to lung sounds or heart sounds and know what is normal and what is not normal. Um, so I think now, like in, in, in being an artist, um, the stakes are high in looking. And I think that's just been embedded in me because you know, I didn't, I don't, I didn't come at looking at art from like, oh, this is, you know, art historical, this is the canon, this is related to this, this is related to that. I've only been tapping into that maybe the past four years. And before that, it was, it was just more about, it was more about lines and curves and patterns. And I realized, well, that's why you had to pay attention to patterns and just like particular blemishes and marks, and that's where, um, if you miss those, then uh, you're gonna be missing something, and yeah, the stakes were high in that, so that was, um, it's a big thing that I learned in critical care. And then I remember I read somewhere that um, there was a spring break or some summer break, and then you went home and you started to play violin before you turned to visual art. Yeah. Yeah it, was, yeah, it was my last year of um, nursing school. Um, my mother had a violin in the house she played. And um, I don't know, it's really strange. I honestly don't know why I started playing. It doesn't make any sense. It really doesn't. And nursing school was so, uh, it was just intense. I had a lot to do all the time. And for whatever reason, yeah, I picked up the violin and Chris, yeah, it was like Christmas break and I was just playing like four hours a day. Just let me figure this out. So did you teach yourself to do that? I mean, yeah, I taught myself to do that. It's a hard instrument. I did, but then, and then I took some lessons. Yeah, I took like maybe like eight or nine lessons and then I went back and just, yeah, continued and taught myself to a certain point. So back to what <clears throat> we're looking at. Tell us a little bit. More. Yeah, yeah, let me move, move forward. Let's move to another slide. Um, so these are, again, they're, they're lines. Um, and it's, um, it's the heart rhythms. Um, and, you know, in, in understanding these lines, um, you know, the difference between an, an inverted curve uh, or a peaked particular element of the, of, the, of the lines of the rhythm, it, you know, there's a confluence of factors that, that lead to it, you know? And, um, it's this thing about, I realize, you know, it's this thing about translation and um, the translation of imagery and what that relates to. Um, translating, looking at these, it's like uh, a curve means it, it leads to, you think about the fluid and the electrolytes in the patient and that leads to a particular type of sound you need to hear and then that can relate to a particular type of um, assessment in looking at the patient. So there's something about translation that I'm really interested in still now um, in, uh, with, with this type of work and then even with like, you know, from other things that I'm working, thinking about like, uh, like sheet music. Yeah, like sheet music. And it looks very much like that. So there's this. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. Um, and the rhythm and patterning. And the rhythm and patterning, for sure. And that leads to one of the first imagery I ever drew in my life um, when, after I learned to draw. <clears throat> and um, I was, uh, I, I drew this book, it was called Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain. My sister was like, you should learn how to draw. Um, and I was like, okay, learned how to draw. And um, after I learned how to draw, she's like, well, you need to draw from life. And like, I was like, I don't like this. This is really boring to me. <laughs> I'm like, I just want to like draw organs and instruments. So this was, you know, this, is, this was up my life at the time, you know. So when is this from? Just oh, yeah, 2010. Yeah, 2010. And then so 2011, yeah. Um, yeah, the one on the left, that's the first image I ever drew, and I was, uh, at the time, working in a, was I working in a medical surgical ICU? And, um, yeah, it was my first year, it was my, uh, no, neuroscience ICU, excuse me. Yeah, and 
yeah, I mean, it was a lot. It was intense, but I loved it. And um, it was, you know, I was just so convicted, you know, working in that, in that place. And yeah, I'm like, let me just. You were still working as a nurse. Right? Yeah, this is, yeah, this is only like, what, 2008. It's my second year. Yeah, it was my second year. And yeah, I drew a set of lungs and um, yeah, I drew a trumpet. I loved, I was started getting into jazz music at the time, went to see a lot of music. And yeah, I was just like, oh, this is cool. Like, yeah, let me do this. And, um, and then I turned it into a t-shirt line. <clears throat> and the image on the right was when I was working um, in the neuro ICU. And it's a set, it's like headphones with like a brain and then a cross section you know, of a brain and it's connected with a little tube that comes out of it. But at the time, I was thinking at this, the little tube that comes out of the cord, it was this apparatus that you use to control the balance within the brain of someone who you're taking care of called an external ventricular device. So, you know, it was a charged thing for me to work with. And even though it's like, it's playful, it's, it's still both, you know, it's still like, it's still the music and the sound, and, but it's also, you know, it's very serious at the same time. See what's next. So this is an uh, image. Um, my sister, shortly after I started making these images, she moved to DC. She's an artist herself, and we she turned these images into canvases. And um, this this t-shirt line brand I had it was called Samothany, and that was like the beginning of like me making art and building community in DC. And um, so she made these canvases, and she used sheet music. Uh, with the backgrounds of them. And <clears throat> then we also, we did Artomatic and did like an installation uh, with like the elements and um, she, I bought a phonograph. I had all kinds of instruments I bought. I bought all the instruments that were the things that I was using. And like, um, and then she, she, you know, designed these red blood cells and like we made this world. So this was like the first installation that I was a part of that she was the architect of. And where is this? This was it. This was in uh, what Crystal City, yeah, Artomatic, two thousand and twelve, yeah, um, yeah. The first time we, you know, collaborated. Well, probably the second time actually, um, but yeah. I mean, essentially the first like installation or something we collaborated on together. And this is this was shortly after that. Um, I got interested in work with paper because my sister worked with paper and materials. Um, <clears throat> she was into materials via sculpture and via just like works on paper. And I was starting to, you know, just think deeper about, you know, what art is and what it, what it can be. And um, thinking like what is around me and, you know, what makes sense for me. So I started collecting rhythms from patients who I took care of when I worked in the um, uh, neuroscience intensive care unit at Fairfax Hospital. And um, <clears throat> I started making individual pieces with them. And the first piece on the left is, uh, it's a rhythm, uh, heart rhythm with sheet music behind it, which is like literally the translation of, you know, the, the t-shirt images. Um, and the rhythm on the right is just like, just a collage method of just fun things at the time. But this was the first time I worked with paper as a material. And the only reason why I ended up falling into um, wanting to understand paper in the way that I did and thinking that there was more in it than you know just a flat surface. This is an image. Um, one of the first times um, me and my sister and my brother-in-law exhibited together. They're artists as well, and I wouldn't be, you know, the artist I am without them. We are, you know, I realize, you know, we're, we're a family, but we're a collective. And um, I learned so much from them, and, you know, they taught me a critical way of uh, understanding work in depth, and, you know, they both work in a uh, many different mediums, and you know, I followed behind them and continue to do that. So, as you're going through this period, sort of working a, a real job, so yeah. to say, and, and 
starting to become more serious in art. Was there like <coughs> a, a moment or like a eureka moment that you realize art is your vocation and art is the way to go or it happened gradually? Yeah, th nah, there was absolutely a eureka moment for sure. It was, um, I think when I started doing the t-shirt, the images, I was like, these are okay, they're not bad. <laughs> First tab, like this is okay. And then when I, did, when I was working with the rhythms, in my head, I was like, there couldn't be anything like more that you would want to work with, like the rhythms of people you're taking care of. Like, there's nothing more important than this. Like, that's literally what I thought. And I thought I was gonna work, be working with these rhythms forever. And it's interesting because it's like they're not like, they're not like, oh, these are so cool heart rhythms. Like, oh, they look so great. But like to me, they were they were everything, you know. So what happened was, um, I was working with the rhythms, and then. I only made like maybe like four pieces, and then they started getting just like dots and stuff on them because they weren't archival. And a good friend of mine, um, and uh, someone who you know, uh, yeah, he gave me a lot of influence earlier was Stan Squiro. He told me, he was like, well, why don't you just scan them, put them in the computer, and blow them up, and then you can work on them in any way. So I did that, and that led to me um, playing with them. In let me see. In this way. So <clears throat> this is um, after I after I um, after I blew them up. I was just playing with paper in different ways, and then I was doing a lot of line work, and I started just using the blade like a pen. And when I started using the blade like a pen and cutting into the paper in a really close way it's like there was like this alchemy that happened and the paper like turned to silk and i it was a eureka moment i literally jumped up and down and like cut myself in the process <laughs> it was because i saw like i just i was obsessed with paper and i saw everything like i saw everything that was made with paper and it was like whoa and i just it just i just knew like if you can do this you know working with paper then like you can do there's so much more to do. And at that moment, <clears throat> it was so much of like a, it was like, oh, this is a break we went through with paper. But what I but I what I realized, you know, probably a couple years after, that it wasn't about paper. It was like, this is just a creative breakthrough. And like you understand how your mind works and you know, this frequency that you think on. And before, and then shortly after, um, there was this <clears throat> Shortly after I had that little breakthrough, or big breakthrough, um, there was a, um, a video I watched. It was like on, I think it was Netflix, it was called Between the Folds. And this, um, yeah, there was this quote on there. And it was about this um, scientist, physicist, who was working with paper to figure out <laughs> what that says. <laughs> molecules twist into complex shapes um, that are key to the biological function, practicing how they do would help pharmaceutical firms design more effective drugs. So something happened. Um, it's really interesting. Um, it, after reading that and reading what this particular physicist, what he figured out and what it did um, in terms of like something scientific, I don't know, it really, it just, it dialed in something into me. And I don't know, I just started exploring it in a different way. And um, so it's just interesting how words and like a prompt can, uh, and a process can really lead you to tapping into a way that you wouldn't otherwise before. So yeah, between this and this, it was probably like, maybe like three months. <clears throat> I started, when I started working with paper, um, these are all individual sheets. Um, and it, yeah, they're all individual. It's a single sheet of paper. It was 2014, probably like uh, February, March, maybe like March, maybe like six months after I like discovered a little bit about paper. And um, <clears throat> they're all, sheets that were like 8.5 by 11. So when I started working with it, it felt like I've just been working with it forever. Like it just made sense to me. 
Tell us more about the process. I mean, it's so sculptural. Yeah. Yeah, so <clears throat> um, I ended up using, I mean, when I was working with this, I just used one tool. I just used an exacto yeah, knife. No, yeah, it was just one tool. And um, I, I was working at the time, I think I was working one to two days a week at the time. Um, and I was working like just like eight hours a day, really. And um, I was just so patient and just exploring, really. And when I was making these pieces, it was just, it was like just completely from the heart and just like a place of exploration. Um, and it was so much just about like my experiences, just, you know, working in the hospital. So much about understanding myself, um, so much about like, monuments to like these people who I'm taking care of, just kind of reflecting all of those different, you know, traumatic experiences, the ups and the downs and thinking about healing and thinking about the microbiological world and genetics and just all of that. And I just, I just, I made a lot of them. And um, it was, yeah, it was just, just this slight little nuanced exploration. I, I was working in a, I think, pack you at the time. Um, so I was thinking a lot about surgical, you know, surgery because that was, you know, what was happening. So, but at the same time, they were just, you know, I like just making beautiful things, you know, at the time, you know, that's just kind of what I was interested in. But, you know, they felt very cellular and uh, tapestral and fabric based as well. Here's just a couple more. So sensual too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I was, I mean, I was really influenced by, I think a lot. Of, honestly, like it was a lot of fabric-based things and also like fashion-based things too. Um, so I started working with photos, probably 2016. Um, <clears throat> I made a lot of those works on paper. The the individual ones, 8.5, I don't know, I probably made like 50 or 60, I made a lot. Um, and then it made sense to me to like start working with photos because I kind of realized it was like, you're kind of like building like this anatomy and this language with paper, but like you're talking about like, you're starting to talk, you want to start talking about like, uh, what is, you know, what is visible, you know, life. So the first thing I started doing, I did like these self portraits. And I went about it just, uh, um, yeah, just very intuitively, really. Um, and the particular piece on the right, I was like thinking about like open heart surgery and like a chest being cracked open. Um, a lot of people don't know that, but that's just where I was. That was my life. I wasn't like, I wasn't thinking about. So where would you find photographs? Uh, or did you? F oh, well, this is me. I, my friend okay. Surly okay. took photos. Yeah, she took photos of me of these ones. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I might have did like five or six, seven, eight, maybe self portraits. This is um, a piece of uh, Nick Caves. This is one of his sound suit. He was probably the first contemporary artist that I was introduced to. And I just loved, you know, I loved his work. And I think it really started to influence me, like how I went about making work um, <clears throat> and probably still does. But um, yeah, in um, a lot of these, these works, you know, that influence the scene. So after I just started working with like friends of mine, and I think in that place, I was still like, I was still working in the hospital and I was still like in that hospital place and thinking about the work, the figures were very still, but I was starting to kind of like move out of there as well because I wanted to talk about other elements of life. I think there is a lot of cutting off or erasures. You said what? There are a lot of like cutting off pieces or erasures. Yeah. Yeah, I think at that time <clears throat> I was so I was just still in that hospital mindset. Later on I started thinking about like historical context and history and erasures for sure. I have some pieces where it was just like busts and um, yeah, there's cutting off like around the torsos or like around the heads. And I started thinking about it from a place of like, okay, like what's the implications of like what you're doing? Because I didn't want to continue going about like being ignorant, you know, um, with 
charged imagery, um, you know, what you're doing. So then I started like, okay, um, thinking about it like in that way. And um, it's interesting, you know, thinking about going about making art <clears throat> and where I was and how I was making and what I was being guided by. And it's something that has obviously, it's very much changed throughout these short chapters, you know, in my life. Um, another self-portrait. Uh, an arm. This was probably 2016. Probably around the same time. And this is also starting off with photographs? Yeah, then, photographs, you know? yep. Yeah, single sheet of paper, yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, at this time, it was just kind of just really um, exploring just um, the paper, but also just boundaries, something like I was like always thought about freedom and boundaries. So I would wanted to pull as much as I could out of just black and white. I always thought like if I could pull as much out of, you know, a limited um, uh, amount of material and subject matter I'm working with that it'll, that, it, yeah, I mean, that in moving forward, you know, I'll really be more agile, you know, in understanding what I'm working with. So it's interesting, yeah, they're all black and whitish. Right? Yeah. Color did not interest you at that time? No, I didn't understand it, yeah. It was, yeah, I didn't understand it, and I was just laser focused hmm. on a particular <laughs> way of going about doing things, you know. I knew, I knew I just wanted to work a boundary, like exhaust it, until it's like, okay, I figured out you know, as much yeah. as I can with this, you know. Um, yeah, it wasn't until later, so I started working with color. We'll get there, though. Um, this particular piece, <clears throat> this was, like, the first time where, like, I engaged, like, a particular um, political subject matter. I think this was 2016, 17. This was, like, before the, um, uh, during the elections around 2017, and it was just images of, um, it was like these violent acts happening at Trump rallies. And I was, um, <clears throat> I feel like, yeah, I mean, where I was living in DC, I think the only art like I saw that I really was paying attention to, I feel like was fed to me was like a lot of portraiture and, and then like politically based work. So I was like, oh, let me, like, let me see what this is. And, um, I went about these pieces just like in a very, like, let me just explore like what, what this is, let me figure out language like that I'm using for these pieces. Um, and then I continued to move on to do, you know, a lot of work that was like very directly political. Um, this particular piece was, this was the first time I ever went out and took photos, like as a photographer. Um, this was when tr uh, Trump got elected. Um, and um, there's some other people in here who were taking photos during that time who were out there. And yeah, I was, I was like, let me go take some photos. Let me go see what it feels like. Uh, a big part of, I guess, making art for me is like, it's like experiencing something. Cause I feel like if I experience something, I'm there, I'm present, then I understand it. I'm more convicted by it. And it doesn't feel so much like a performance or something to me. So I went out and took photos and it was a really weird time and <laughs> I was like, it was the first time I took photos, so I was like scared to get all up in people's faces. Um, um, and, but I ended up just kind of thinking about information when I was working with these, um, these pieces and um, just editing, editing signs, editing the windows. And it was the first time really interacting with like architecture and other things, but people. But it kind of, it started to teach me that like, you know, what you what you have you know your way of approaching is like you have like a language and you're gonna apply it to different things. Shortly after that, um, I realized like the way that I go about working with um, uh, with the language um, and working into the bodies, uh, the figures, um, was influenced by diagnostic imagery. I was doing it, but I didn't realize it, and I. There was a time where I had to really sit and think about it. And I was like, oh, the reason why you're interacting with, um, 
how you go about placing, you know, the different textures on the body and playing with the gray scales um, and the elements of feeling like musculature and anatomy was uh, because of this diagnostic imagery. And when I did that, that really made me think about a different way of how like, I approach um, the work. And here's color. And here's some color, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, and it's also interesting because, I, yeah, I didn't use color because my head was just like, I don't know, somehow I started thinking about things in a very, um, just, yeah, art making in this very uh, scientific way. Um, and I gave myself uh, really, really strong boundaries um, that I couldn't break. But then when I saw there was, oh yeah, well there's color in diagnostic imagery, so you can use color too. <laughs> um, yeah, it's been a, it's, I mean, it's been a, it's been a time being able to be like, playful with art. Um, I think it's because it came from such a, the genesis of it came from such a attached, like intimate, real place that I wasn't like in a playful way, in a playful place, you like working with it. But it's been nice to move along and become a little more detached, you know, in, in making art. So when you were working as a nurse, um, did you collect x-rays <laughs> or all the graphs <laughs> that you can get from, from the hospital as inspiration or you just looked at them? No, no, I'm, I, I did not, but I paid attention. Mm -hmm. I remember just looking at all the lines and I just loved them. <laughs> And um, I really remember looking at the, the imagery, you know, the x-rays, the CT scans. I remember looking at the videos, yeah. the echocardiograms, um, the angiogram, echocardiograms, which is a video of inside of the heart, um, the an angiograms, which is imagery of, of vasculature within, and I was just enamored by them. And um, now I started We'll get. We'll see those later on when we get to uh, a video piece that I did recently later on. But yeah, at the time I was, I loved it. It was just so interesting to me, really. Um, this is just another artist, uh, Belkis Ayan, who I saw her work when I moved to New York. She had a show, 2017, at Museo del Barrio, and there was already like a kinship in terms of like the aesthetic of the work. <clears throat> and then I learned about her Cuban printmaker. Um, and um, there, was, uh, in, there was something in this element of print that really interested me. There was texture on the print. Um, my work was you know, so textured, but textured for me, you know, um, having to do such, uh, I guess, I don't know, laborious, intensive process. And um, she did something called Collagraph where it was a print process where the texture was made through more of like a gesture of a process. So I don't I kind of was like, I want, I want like those elements in my work and I, I played around and figured out some things. On this particular piece, it's just on the right side of, the piece on the right, it's the right arm. And it's, a, um, it's something where I just paint the white paper and then I do a frittage, a process where I put like fabric underneath and graphite over it. And <clears throat> this is the first time that, um, this is the first time, second time, I guess? Yeah, first, uh, no, nah, there was something else that came before, but this is where I started engaging this element of print. And um, I first did it, uh, I think the images are later on, we'll get there, but I've, in engaging print, um, something made sense to me with it and still does. And I just kind of, and I, I'm i not like, I never like, oh, let me do printmaking. I just like go about things, how my mind is like thinking and what I fall into. And um, again, I feel like the, the idea of printmaking, um, yeah, there's something that makes sense to me with it because of, uh, because of diagnostic imagery. Um, uh, it also allows you to layer things and collage them in a way. Absolutely. Yeah, layer and collage. And get the texture. 
exactly. Yeah, and aesthetically, yeah, it makes sense and ends up working um, yeah, for me. So drawing, photography, printmaking. Yeah, yeah, I guess those are the first, you know, elements that I really, um, yeah, engaged with. Um, and with that, uh, with um, understanding like printmaking, it made me um, think about radiology, you know, and I was like, well, you know, radiology was very much this idea of, I mean, it's imagery, it's photography in a way, but it's, it's, it's kind of, it's printmaking as well. So it's like, um, well, it's a way of seeing and like a, a translation. So I would got curious about like radiology and started reading about the history of radiology and like what that came from, like what were the accidents that happened that, you know, led to, you know, the ways of seeing, you know, the unseen and, you know, to understand this way of care. That's another thing that's really interesting about those cameras, about that imagery. It's all about care and understanding. That's like the intention for them. Um, this particular image is from my first solo in uh, New York City at uh, Fridman Gallery. And um, I moved to New York in 2017, September. Um, I had a residency at this place called Pioneer Works, which is a multidisciplinary institution, incubator of sorts, that really um, uh, prides itself on um, housing um, uh, scientists and uh, music. Um, it's a, I mean, it's a world-class music venue. They have scientists in residence and science programming and music studio and music programming and photography and dark rooms and ceramics and like pretty much anything. So I went there <clears throat> and um, I kind of learned, started to learn like what, what art can be and like kind of like what type, type of artist I want to be. And um, it was kind of like this, I feel like it was like this MFA like I never had. Um, so, um, I wanted I wanted my first solo show to be comprised of in New York to be comprised of um, all of these different elements that I want to you know continue forward with you know in my practice and um, the show was called Latent Tapestries and it was a combination of uh, it was figurative images um, in some were like particular stances of like movement, dancing, but some were just kind of like in uh, like weird precarious positions. Um, and then there was uh, these monument works, which I worked on, um, which at the time was 2020. There was like um, a lot happening with that at the time. And um, this is a this is a photo of. Uh, Titus Kafar's work, which was a huge uh, inspiration, you know, in working with monument pieces and thinking about history and, you know, and thinking about like, how do I apply my own language and way of understanding and seeing, you know, to, um, you know, uh, historical matters. Um, <clears throat> so let's go a little bit deeper into yeah. this because I think this is where political For sure. thinking comes Definitely. into play. Yeah. Um, inspiration with equestrian statues mm -hmm. of Confederate officers. For sure. 2020 or yeah. uh, yes, all it's the 2020. turmoil that is happening. Yeah. To what extent that really inform your work or need to express your own relationship to memory and all how we look at the history? For sure. Tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, so um, it's interesting. I went to... Uh, when I went to Richmond the first time, probably like, I don't know, 2014, 13, probably before that, my sister went to VCU there, and I saw these monuments, and I'm like, these are amazing. I'm like, these are beautiful. <laughs> like, that's what I thought about them. I didn't, I didn't know the historical, you know, it was probably 2008, 2009, probably something like that. I'm like, wow, these are really amazing. And fast forward, you know, I'm learning about them, and everything's, you know, all of the, the 
conversations, you know, are coming up around them. I think a huge thing that really um, <clears throat> allows me to think about history in like a particular way is, you know, what you mentioned in the beginning, you know, thinking about, um, no worries, thinking about uh, what you were saying, what you said earlier about the unseen, the nuanced points of view, and this, um, this balance of understanding thing. I think being from a biracial family has really influenced, you know, my uh, approach to understand history, for sure. Because, you know, you're always trying to um, level, you know, with people who don't agree with your thinking, you know, and learn from them and one another and this push-pull thing. So in approaching um, these uh, monument works, <clears throat> it's like, I mean, I went to Richmond again in 2019. I went there, took photos, spent time, walked around, um, read things that were up, don't take our monuments down, all these different things. And um, <clears throat> it's like approaching these, uh, you know, it's approaching these monuments and approaching these histories from a place of care and understanding, but like from a, you know, from a, a way of understanding it and thinking about the health of it. Thinking about the health of it and thinking about the, um, the, the, the you know, the, the myth of it and thinking about history and thinking about the fragility of it and allowing these monuments that are stone, um, that are uh, bronze, turning them, letting them be um, penetrable, you know, by giving them like this flesh. And um, so how I approached them was just to, the same way that I think about like, a, I guess a patient, right? Um, I applied the same language to it that like these CTs and x-rays have and gave it like this, you know, anatomical forms, you know, in the legs. And then I have these elements coming down from, uh, this is particular one is Robert E. Lee. The body and the horse it looks like it's being, you know, uh, disintegrated or like eaten away. Um, maybe there's a parasite in it or something. Um, so a big <clears throat> portion of this, the show, Latent Tapestries, was, um, <clears throat> oh no, this is the video. Okay, this is the video. Uh, yeah, a big portion of the show, wait, is that the right one? Wait, no, that's not it. Did I put the wrong one? Let me see. Oh, shoot. <laughs> Maybe I put the wrong one. Oh, yeah, that's it. Cool. All right. So a big portion was um, <clears throat> it was doing a video piece. I really wanted to do a video piece because something made sense with me in video in my head. I never did one, but I was like, something makes sense about video to me. And the way I approached this video piece, when I knew I wanted to do a video piece, was with Pioneer Works. And I was, um, there was an artist there, and he was doing like a study on how people like interact with things on, it was just a whole bunch of stuff on the ground. And one thing was a basketball. I'm like, I love basketball. This is so cool. I'm like, basketball in an art place? This is wonderful. And I started dribbling it and making, he wanted you to make sounds and noise with it. And then it was like, oh wow, that's when like this light went off. And I really understood that like, <clears throat> this way of you, uh, you know, your art, your whole life was understanding like the kinetics of your body. And, um, and yeah, the kinetics of your body and then all these different disciplines that you've engaged with. And that's kind of how you understand rhythm and patterns and intention and composition. And something just like really went off. And then from there, it was thinking about, um, I thought about, I was thinking about these different uh, disciplines that I engaged in from such like a, from an anthropo anthropological point of view and <clears throat> what really made me do it is training um, capoeira because it was kind of like this um, I don't know it's this 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 diamond of a discipline of movement of you know the African diaspora that you know could have only happened with uh, you know a confluence of factors that you know historically in such a complex way that happened. So it made me really think about um, movement in general like that. So at the time, I was, I was boxing, um, just shadow boxing a lot, and I was just paying attention to my hands, just looking at them every day. 
And um, I was like, okay, boxing and like movement and hands and rhythm and patterns. And it made me think of, um, <clears throat> I saw it, there was something in the video or something me seeing my hands moving. For some reason, it made me think of echocardiograms, which is like a video of the heart, um, a video internally of the heart beating. Because I realized um, there was something about repetition and um, it doesn't come from one thing, it comes from many things. Um, but the videos, diagnostic videos, it's a you have to pay so close attention and you have to find these tiny moments that are there or not there of imbalance. Like, is this causing this? Is this imbalance there or is it not? So it's about this careful looking and you have to keep going back and forth to figure out like where the imbalance is. Um, and at the same time, I, you know, um, I train different movements all the time. So in terms of me moving, I think about it. But in terms of video, that's, I was like, I like this. This kind of makes sense for the direction for video for me because it ends up being about like this careful looking but rhythm and pattern. So let's just play the video. <laughs> and I guess I'll talk a little bit about the plan. <clears throat> so this is the first time I did a video. Um, this was downstairs from the work that was upstairs. And the sound, the like continuous repetition is, um, I got uh, sound from the audience of, um, oh my gosh, I just forgot his name. The fight, the great fight, uh, 1910. Um, having a brain fall, Chuck Johnson, excuse me. Yeah, so I got audio from online of the, of the audience of the fight. Um, and then I also got um, audio, the, the violins that you heard was from William Grant's Afro-American Symphony, um, which was, I mean, Jack Johnson was the first African-American to fight boxing in a boxing match. And uh, William Grant still is the first African-American to compose a symphony. Um, and it was like the most played symphony up until like the 1940s. Um, and then there's also a little bit of a, a, sh a piece from Chopin, a piece that was made I think was like 1930s, which is right here. And um, I realized uh, this was, it kind of just all came together. But it, what I realized it was kind of like, it was kind of like a slice, it was kind of like a CT, like of the world in like a particular way, bringing together sound and bringing together um, movement. Cool, I think that's good. So it was like the first way that I kind of understood like um, going about understanding sound and movement and the relationship, you know, between the relationship between them, you know, and the, the implications of sound and thinking about sound in such an anthropological way and movement as well. Speaking of sound, so are you still playing violin or were you playing? You know what? I haven't played the violin or something else in a while. Yeah, I stopped playing the violin when I started drawing. Uh, a couple years after I started drawing because it was too much. I couldn't focus on two things. But I... Um, I, over the pandemic, I got a piano, and so I have a piano, and I've been, you know, I just like figuring things out. I haven't taken lessons or anything. I just, you know, understand sound the way how I want to sound, understand it, and. And the reason I'm asking is because <clears throat> we'll get to see it later. That yeah. music becomes a really important part of your work. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, and even the show. Uh, where's the other one? Oh, that's it right there. Yeah, this was um, this was a sound inst a sound installation that I did that was part of the same show. So downstairs was um, William Grant Still. It was the which was 1930s. It was the boxing 
which was 1910, it was at Chopin. And then upstairs was, um, I talked to uh, five of like some of my favorite musicians, artists to create, uh, I commissioned them to create uh, pieces that um, speak to, you know, the prompt of the show. And they're all like jazz avant-garde musicians and like I've seen them all play and I understand like the, you know, the, the discography of everything they've made. And um, I wanted them, yeah, to, to create pieces. And there was a uh, installation, the gallery was, um, it was all around the gallery, like in the periphery. And it was, um, it was a moving, immersive installation. So I programmed it so the sound just kind of like moved all around the gallery in different ways. So the sound, you know, was just reminiscing, you know, you felt memory, you felt time, you felt things passing and everybody just made very different pieces. And then I made a, a whole piece out of what they did, inter, uh, interchanging different elements of uh, each a piece with one another. So we'll just play like 10 seconds of each of the musicians and I'll <clears throat> So this is um, Ben Lamar Gay. He's an amazing musician out of Chicago. And he has just he has I don't could have a wide range of, uh, he, he does so much. And the particular piece that he made, um, he had, it was sounds from uh, a church in Uganda. Um, and then there was some uh, some trumpet as well and some drums as well. Um, the next piece, you can play this one. This is um, Casa Overall, a friend of mine who Peter, I collabed Rapper with. Rapper and chanteur de Brooklyn, Casa Overall, he, he announced his new album, Casa Overall. I think there was drums and there was trumpet within this piece. Um, and then the next one... This was Luke Stewart, which is a hometown hero. <laughs> I love Luke. Um, I met Luke here in like 2012, one of my favorite uh, um, musicians. And he made this piece, which was just this deep, he just worked with electricity really. Um, and it was, this was when a, this was really special because it moved throughout the gallery and it just like really rumbled, um, like when it moved past you. There was a really interesting effect with it. Um, Okay, next one is Melanie Charles. She's a really um, incredible musician out of Brooklyn. And there was some flute and, um, and drums. And I really interchanged her flute a lot with Luke's, uh, the, electrici the electricity sound. And the last one is uh, Matana Roberts, who's an extraordinary musician and artist. Who, um, her piece was uh, very atmospheric, and I felt a lot of different things with it. There's moments where I heard like train sounds, and it was such an honor working with them and collaborating with them. So, you know, I mean, this was, you know, thinking about jazz music and. Um, the, which was, you know, came out of um, blues and, and, and spirituals and gospel and all of these things interchanged with the, the movement, um, you know, the black figures in the movement and the, um, and the, uh, and the Confederate um, statues. I was thinking about it like it was um, kind of like the, the sound, you know, of, of the time. You know, it's kind of like what came out of it you know, it was distilled like the truth or something. Um, this particular piece right here um, is, uh, I made after this one, it's the same piece. And <clears throat> it was uh, after the, the monuments were coming down and it was, I was just kind of thinking about like the life of them and the, the health and like the care of them and at the particular time, you know, this is kind of like uh, how I was thinking about them and like the, you know, the, the myth of, uh, that is embedded in the historical ways of looking at these ideas too. And this is um, another one. Tell us about the scale, give us a sense of the scale. The scale? Yeah, yeah they're 44 inches tall by 65 inches wide. 
Um, yeah, and this one is in the collection of the Brooklyn Museum. And this one is in the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. Like, right where I was taking the photos, right down the road. Yeah. Yep. That can hand day, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Um, <clears throat> so next, these are some, this is kind of like when I started, I guess, uh, understanding like world, like world building and like what are these figures doing? Uh, what, what, what is comprised of the world? And um, it was listening to uh, a Max Roach song, really. I can't remember what it is at the time. Um, but something just went off in my head and it told me like, yes, like this is the direction for you. And um, <clears throat> I started working with color at this time. This is like 2021. Um, I started working with color, the printmaking element, um, working with frittage in the background with like graphite. But it was, it, I was like, started being confident in terms of like the movements and you know, it's like, I mean, it makes sense for me, like understanding movement and disciplines of movement is, you know, something I love and understand and um, in music and starting to like, yeah, bring these worlds together. Here's just some close ups. And this is an image, <clears throat> uh, images from my most recent show, um, which was the Fredman Gallery, September, October. It was called Tuning the Current. And um, <clears throat> this was um, two years uh, after my last show, which was in 2020, March 1st, 2020. <laughs> right before everything, yeah, right before we went to a catastrophic time in the world. And the time was, uh, I guess those, those couple years, it was a time to really think about, um, it was a time to build on my craft and uh, making art and understanding that and also working on myself and just thinking about how to, uh, how to make, continue to make and push, you know, making from a place of, uh, I guess, authenticity and integrity and really putting myself into the work more. Um, <clears throat> these particular, this is a piece, um, I started incorporating an element of like embossing in the background, um, which is, uh, just kind of came about from after, um, just really some things I did at a paper residency called Doudinet. Um, this is first like a, a diptych I did, bringing two pieces together. These are dancers. Yeah, and so this, this is, is new right, <clears throat> it is, yeah. So I, yeah, yeah, I leaned in and I went like all the way and let these um, people, you know, who I'm taking photos, because I took photos of other people who are dancers too, but I ended up using these like precarious positions, like are they dancing, are they not? And I think <clears throat> what happened with me, I kind of started understanding what role, how I think about dance and movement, and I really started understanding like, oh, this is just, like this is another language, just like uh, music and like just like diagnostic imagery. And um, it was like, so it was like a confident understanding of the place that it like held in my life. And I really started to understand and like investigate and think about how movement is such a big part of my life. And I realized it's like this place of, um, it's like this time travel for me because that's what I know more than anything and I've done it since I've been a child. And I've done, I mean, basketball my entire life, uh, you know, boxing since I've been like college, Capoeira was like 2013, 14 up to now. And each type of movement, I tap into a different part of my life. And like- You said martial arts, what kind of martial arts? Oh, I mean, I, when I was young, I did like Kung Fu, but then um, Capoeira at like 2012, 13. But yeah, movement, it's this place of, of finding myself and it taps me into different parts of my life. And I can like remember just like 
it I attach it to different behaviors that like um like are you still doing the same thing now that like you did back then when you were playing it's it's really weird, but I really started making that connection you know with it so it's um so it's just it using it in terms of my art like in a profound place that like uh, it really makes sense you know for me here's detail another small piece I was in the show and I'm gonna get to talking more about the show in general where are those videos at okay here they are so all right so um so in doing this show <coughs> um I knew in making this show, I knew I wanted to make a piece about the past two years, you know, about the COVID times as soon as like, um, you know, it hit um, because, obviously because of my background, you know, and I, um, I was like, yeah, because I mean, I felt like, I'm like, wow, I should be working now. I kind of felt guilty not working actually. Um, I really did. And um, <clears throat> so I was like, okay, I really want to make a piece about this and, you know, how are you, like, yeah, how are you going to go about doing this? And with everything that was happening, I just started, um, there was so much going on and I just, like, printed imagery, like, diagnostic imagery and just, like, put it up in my studio and just looked at it and messed with it and played with it. And then I understood the best way to work with it is to, is to use it in the way that it's, like, used, like, in, vi in like, a video format and, like, a stop motion format is what it is because a lot of these images are just individual images that make up the video the full test so um this show this show which was yeah just it started with like the video and um i just wanted to be kind of like uh just be poetry really with the movement and the dancing you know which was on the upper level and then there were some abstract works which i'll show and then there was um and then there was a video. Um, I'll go back to the abstract works real quick. This was a piece I did um, <clears throat> at a place called Dudenay, um, and it's just process oriented. I worked with uh, diff different materials and put it on like paper pulp, and painted it, and then put it through some different uh, some processes, and um, it ends up just feeling kind of like it really taps back for me, it taps back into the first way that I started making the white paper pieces early on, except it does it just through like a gesture of process, which is really interesting, which is kind of like understanding and really like being aligned with this particular way in which I make, you know. Um, I'm gonna play, can we play the second video first with the sound twice? Okay. Not this one, not that one. Is, oh no, is a link? Oh no, the link, it was on the, wasn't it? Didn't we see it? Yeah, I don't know how it, yeah, that's right. I think I put it in the wrong, the wrong place. Cause I think we saw it. On the, um, no, I think it's, Right. Yeah, it's right one of those, right? <clears throat> oh, that's right, we put it up top. That's right. The Vimeo one. Yeah, so yeah, so this is uh just a clip from the video. So what I did was I worked with elements of diagnostic imagery. Um uh, CT scans, some of patients who had COVID, uh, angiograms, uh, which is the circulation inside, and, um, and ultrasounds. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the other element I worked with, and for me, the diagnostic imagery, it was kind of like, um, you know, everything that was happening, it's kind of, in my, it was kind of like distilled into these images. It was like the, you know, the tension between, um, uh, the natural world and society in the broadest way of, you know, thinking about it. And it was like, in terms of the time, this is what everything was about, you know, the internal uh, 
the internal um, workings really in health, you know, of people's bodies. So I use that imagery. The other imagery I used was um, weather data because I was thinking about language again and thinking about how to uh, how to communicate um, the global aspect of the time and weather kind of made sense because like whatever happens in one area affects the area another area just like a system and I found some weather data that happened on really um, from a friend of mine who works with maps that really uh, match kind of like the aesthetic of my work and then also I used I used movement um, of people who I took who I took photos of in my studio who were subjects of the work um, and except the images just like the CT scans or the the movement just like the CT scans it's they're made in like a stop motion way so I used the images and just rearranged and re choreographed them and just you know tried to make a poetry with everything so you can go ahead and play it. And that's like on the two ends is circulation of the brain. <laughs> So that's a portion, and then um, I'm gonna play, we'll play um, uh, another part of the, the end of the video. Which, the sound's not gonna play on this, but this was the end of the video. And um, I was looking at, I was scrolling through the imagery for the left part, which is, um, it was a uh, angiogram of the heart, circulation of the heart, and then I was scrolling through imagery of this mover dancer, and I realized that they were like the same shape. So I brought them together, and it was really interesting how those worlds collided there. Um, and then thinking about like uh, the imagery with the with the trumpet and the lungs and the brain and the music and how it, it's kind of like the same thing, just translated in a different way. Yeah. I think your work speaks beautifully about arts and sciences, two sides of the same coin of understanding the world. Yeah. In a different nonverbal way. <clears throat> right. Yeah. The um. Yeah, it was interesting. The um. The video, it was just a big, uh, just a big breakthrough, and I really think um, it's kind of like I was able to, uh, like, make the barriers between these different disciplines, you know, of or pillars, in ways that I'm thinking like they kind of disappeared from, um, they disappeared, yeah, and it was just by finding, you know, these particular frequencies, you know, that they run on and. Um, the, the relationships visually, but obviously the the relationships in, internally, you know, between everything. And how they converge. Exactly. Beautiful. Is this the last slide? I think, yeah, oh, I think, yeah, this is the last slide. This is just a still of, um, a still from the video. But yeah, that's the last slide. Thank you, so from <clears throat> drawing to photography, to printmaking, to video, and dance. And what's next? And sound. And sound. Um, what's next? Um, I, it's interesting, there's from, you know, it's really interesting from going through, like, I think about them like when you have little, or I think about, when I went, I went back to Dudenay, um, that paper making lab, and um, 
just recently, July, from, I did the residency at that paper making lab in 2018. <clears throat> and that's how I started working with fabrics. And I work with them so much in a print making way. Just the, the print of it, the texture of it. And yeah, it was the genesis of this print making element. And then I went back, I knew I needed to go back and I went back in July and it's interesting, I figured something out just completely not even working with paper, just kind of like the remnants of what I was working with. So um, it's like when you go through these little windows that open up to you, um, or if you recognize them, it's like you just have to go through them instead of like, oh, like, but I want to make this particular thing. I want to make that particular thing. I think I'm really understanding when something's like revealed to you, you don't know what's going to be through it, right? Just like working with the diagnostic imagery, working with the heart, you know, the, um, the cardiac, you know, the electrocardiograms early. I didn't know what that would lead to, you know? Um, but it led to me being here, really. I am watching time, and um, yes, thank you. Uh, I would love to open up uh, now the space for questions and answers from public. We have another microphone, so uh, if anybody has a question, we have a few minutes left. Yes. Um, hello. Um, I first encountered your work because the college I worked at the Museum of collected one of your pieces. Um, and I was just curious how you would sort of place your work into a learning environment and then also in a campus that is like a liberal arts college where you're looking at really inter interdisciplinary studies. Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, <clears throat> I, think, um, I think the way to do it is just to like be really honest about it and not try to make it what it's not really. And I think the elements of, uh, you know, these particular elements of, of science um, and um, of seeing and, uh, yeah, these elements of science, of seeing, of process and like print um, and speaking about kind of like the relationships among them, I think that would be the the way you know to really go about it. But yeah, just just tell the story in a very uh, or the elements, these particular pillars, you know, that I think are um, led to me, you know, seeing and understanding how I do, you know. Don't be shy. There's a lot to process and a lot to look at yeah, and think yeah. about, but there is this, another question. <clears throat> Hello. All right, it works. I just want to say thanks first for everything you've created. You've been on an incredible journey, and it's been fun to watch. Um, Thank you. But I'm curious about the emotional work that comes along with your process and how uh, you've felt as you've gone through various stages. Has there any, ever been any surprising emotions that have come upon you in the process of creating something or working with a particular subject matter? And would you be willing to share a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's interesting. Um, I guess I think about like the series that I worked with. Uh, that was like the images I took in 2017 that was at like the inauguration of Trump. And I remember I was thinking like, I was so, I don't know, I was putting so much weight on like these decision I was making in terms of like, what am I gonna edit out? What am I gonna let show? It was, it was like, it was, I mean, it was compositionally like a lot, but I think it was more, it's like, whoa, I'm, I'm just like, I'm sensitive and I'm really porous, so I'm thinking about like everything happening and making these decisions. Um, but uh, also, I mean, working with this recent, uh, and the monument pieces as well, for sure, in the same way. Yeah, it's like, it's heavy imagery to, to work with. And um, 
it's kind of like, you know, with working with that imagery, it's like you're trying to say a particular thing and you want it to land in a particular place. And the place I'm trying to find is like this, this place of balance and like understanding and caring, you know, for both sides of the spectrum, you know, regarding something. But um, making this video was tough. It was so much. I was engaging this imagery that means um, so much to me and that meant, that still means so much to have to look at and all the, the memories of, of everything. I mean, looking at like, looking at, um, uh, looking at like angiograms of the brain is like, it's so heavy because yeah, I mean, it takes me back to, to those, those times and those particular families and particular instances. So I cried a lot making that. <laughs> I cried so much, um, so it's heavy, but um, it's uh, because it can be, you know, coupled with different elements and making a poetic uh, thing. It's something, you know, I just had to do because uh, after you, after I go through making something like that, especially that video, <clears throat> it's like I feel like um, I, uh, yeah, I understand myself better as a person and uh, as a creator, for sure. OK, that's, yeah, we'll have one more question, and that will be. Um, <coughs> Nate, um, I was just curious to know, with your switch from working in a medical field to working, focusing strictly on your art, Yeah. You've spoken so much, and even just now, about the caretaking and, and diagnostics being sort of tools of, of caretaking. Yeah. How does that, and your dedication, I was so impressed, I hadn't realized you'd wanted to be a nurse since you were you know, in the sixth yeah, grade. Yeah, yeah. Do you, do you see art in those same terms of <clears throat> being a tool of caretaking? Is making art still a form of caretaking for you? Or how does that relate to that? in that sense to your earlier practices? Yeah, I think, um, I think you know, earlier on, uh, I was, like I said, I was like so much in just like this, it was kind of like a tight place and really so much this, it was a little bit rigid, but I think it was like real at where I needed to be to understand where I was. And um, I was, yeah, I was making from a particular place, and it was, I mean, I was enjoying what I was doing, but it wasn't like, there wasn't, there's was a looseness, you know, that, you know, there was a looseness that wasn't there. And I think moving forward, like, I think people ask me, <clears throat> I think I got asked recently, like, okay, like, you know, like, why do you make art? And it's it's been changing, you know, um, because um, cause art is, you know, it's broad, and, I realize, you know, the way I want to make art is, uh, um, I don't want to have, make it from this place of, you know, this particular diagnostic place and, you know, uh, telling a particular thing and I just like want to make poetic things, really. Yeah. And so it is art. <clears throat> And with that note, um, I want to thank you all for coming and joining us tonight. And have a wonderful, restful evening. And um, thanks again thank for you. joining us in DC.